Hey again, movie buffs, and welcome to the latest episode of Double Feature. I'm your host, Pedro, and in today's episode, I decided I'm taking a break from Western-made titles. So, I'm bringing you two of the most underrated, or at least undermentioned, Japanese movies. Usually I kickstart these episodes with some context or overview of the topic that unites my selections. But to summarize the rich and vast history of Japanese cinema in just a few minutes, well, it isn't an easy task, so I won't do it. Yes! 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 Instead, I'm going to tell you all about my journey in discovering Japanese cinema. It was September 1998, and my eight year old self was eagerly awaiting the cinematic event of the summer the release of Roland Emmerich's Godzilla. Expectations were sky high, and little did I know how disappointed I'd be. But in the process, I learned a very valuable lesson on how poorly made some American remakes truly are. To hype myself for that event, I watched five of the then 22 Japan made Godzilla movies that aired during the week preceding the movie's release. It was awesome. Later, I started to explore the filmography of one of Japan's most famous directors, Akira Kurosawa. And throughout the following years, I discovered all the other incredible titles that came from the land of a rising sun. The violent and daunting portrayal of the country's youth. Japanese society's delicate sensibilities as portrayed in the movies of Yasujiro Uzu. The tales of the Yakuza and the way the organization operated. And even the avant-garde infused titles of the 1960s Japanese New Wave. And whilst there is a lot more to discover, the titles I'm bringing you today aren't frequently mentioned when we address Japan's movie industry output. Two titles that are deeply rooted in Japanese culture, its spiritualism and folklore. Two entries that blend genres as distinct as comedy, fantasy and horror. Two movies that exhibit a unique visual style. Two films that were released in 1988, a pivotal year for both Japanese cinema with the release of the influential anime Akira, and world cinema as well, as the iconic franchise Police Academy lost its lead star, Steve Gutenberg. So let's get to it. Many casual movie watchers believe the real Japanese horror began in the late 1990s with titles such as Hideo Nakara's Ringu and Takashi Miike's Audition springing to people's minds. Reality is that Japanese horror had been a genre cultivated for decades starting immediately after World War II. One of the names that helped to shape J-horror was Nobuhiku Obayashi, mostly known for his insane movie 1977's Haozu. Over a decade later, Obayashi released the discarnates, Hinjitashi to no Natsu, or as it is known inappropriately in the US, Summer Among Zombies. The movie is a surprisingly touching entry, one that doesn't feature floating heads that bite people in the ass. <laughs> In the discarnates, we follow Hidemi Harada, played by Morio Kazama, a successful yet burnt-out TV soap opera writer, as he navigates the tumultuous waters of his midlife crisis. Living alone in a sleek apartment building converted mostly into offices, Harada is stuck in a rut after a painful divorce. His life takes an unexpected turn when he encounters Kay, his only neighbor, a beautiful and troubled young woman. Despite her advances, Harada rebuffs her, consumed by his own despair. One day, whilst doing location scouting, Harada gets lost from his group, and he's inexplicably transported to Asakusa, the vibrant district of his childhood in Tokyo. In a bizarre twist of fate, he meets his long-deceased parents, alive and well, 
Confused and intrigued, he's drawn into their ghostly presence, leading to a series of surreal encounters. Back in Tokyo, Harada finally begins a relationship with Kei, who becomes increasingly obsessed with the ghosts that haunt him. Instead of wallowing in the depths of broken promises, the ill-formed memories of the past, and the perils of rose-tinted glasses of nostalgia, Obayashi weaves a compelling narrative web, where the lead character never for a moment hesitates to trade in his life and youth for validation and the childhood he never had. During the whole movie, Harada seems to be looking and trying to find what he never had as a kid. You could say he's portrayed as a victim. But before we actually elevate Harada to sainthood status, we must ask ourselves, who is he doing this for? We can make the case that Harada isn't even a person, but simply a hollow entity that exists. And here lies the beauty of the Discarnates. A universal yet quite personal tale. All four leading performers are completely aligned with the director's intent, and the quartet delivers subtle, most of the time, and effective performances that are genuine and pure. I think perhaps the only thing that's missing in this preventing this movie from reaching the maximum heights of movie scores is how somewhat underused Harada's job really is in the narrative. There was a lot of potential here to keep us second guessing until the very end with Harada potentially being an unreliable narrator. As a burnt out soap opera writer, the lead could have grown tired of all the melodrama, forced fiction and improbable events and instead decided to rewrite his life or at least his part, employing the same techniques he uses in his job, but aiming for the exact opposite outcome, a blissful and idyllic childhood. Still, as is, the movie is near perfect. I know my review and analysis is a bit up in the air, but trust me, uh, the least you know before you watch it, the better. It's a horror title that almost has a soul and spirit, boasting a stunning and surprising ending that none of us can envision. A title that was recommended by a great friend, and that certainly made a great impression on me. Those of you familiar with last year's All of Us Strangers will no doubt find similarities between the two movies. Andrew Hay, the director of the 2023 film, has stated that his movie is a loose adaptation of Taishi Yamada's novel Strangers, the source material for the Discarnates. I recommend this one to all the fans of J-Horror, moving spiritual tales and overall unique feel-good titles uh, because I think this movie has something for everyone. Tito Monogatari, or Tokyo's The Last Megalopolis Action, starts in 1912 with Yosumasa Hirai providing some exposition around the background of the city of Tokyo and the looming danger of the spirit of the real-life figure Tairo no Masakado. Hirai and Baron Eishi Shibusawa agree to join forces and turn Tokyo into a blessed city, setting up the basic good versus evil confrontation that drives the movie's whole narrative. Shibusawa and Hirai's efforts are thwarted by Yasunori Kato, a former lieutenant in the Imperial Army who wants to awaken Masakado's spirit and destroy Tokyo. To achieve his mission, Kato kidnaps Yukari Tatsumiya, a young psychic medium who is a direct descendant of Masakado. The lieutenant plans to use her as a vessel for Masakado's rebirth. Yoshiro Tatsumiya, Yukari's brother, and an official in the Ministry of Finance, and his friend Junishi Narutaki, who is in love with Yukari, must join forces and build their own spiritual power to save both the damsel in distress and the city of Tokyo. The trio is also joined by the likes of Dr. Makoto Nishimura, a scholar and engineer who aims to counter Kato's dark ambitions by combining technological advancements with spiritual defenses. As the battle intensifies, Tokyo becomes a battleground for supernatural forces. 
This is, of course, a very brief, albeit complex, summary of everything that goes on in this ambitious yet flawed adaptation of the iconic comic book. For Tokyo, The Last Megalopolis has at least four or five main plots, including a subplot of an expedition of a team of scientists that go into the underground beneath Tokyo, straight into Masakado's grave to prevent his resurrection. The critical assessment of this title is probably the most bipolar thing you'll ever hear. When released in 1988, it was hailed as the best Japanese science fiction production of all time, and was an instant commercial success. But as the years went by and both the rest of the world and a newer audience in the movie's native country experienced Megalopolis, opinions quickly changed, and it's easy to understand why. Director Akio Jisoji and screenwriter Kaizu Hayashi tried to condense four of the twelve volumes that comprise the novel into a two-hour movie. As a result, the film moves at a pace that's practically impossible to follow in a single watch. The film's editing is a tad convoluted, making the final output even more complex and producing an overall patchy movie. Add to that frantic editing an extensive ensemble cast that would put the Lord of the Rings trilogy to shame and mainstream audiences' lack of knowledge about Japanese mysticism and you have the recipe for disaster. The cherry on top of this messy cinematic cake is the then extravagant 1 billion yen budget that positioned Megalopolis as Japan's second most expensive movie, just behind 1985's production of Akira Kurosawa's Ran. The last Megalopolis has often been compared to David Lynch's Dune, an ambitious adaptation of a beloved yet dense sci-fi piece that is largely seen as a convoluted mess though Frank Herbert's novel was far more political than anything seen in The Last Megalopolis. So, you may be asking, why should I waste my time with this movie? The answer? Because there are a lot of positives. As an outsider watching this movie decades after its heyday, you can't help but admire a visually exciting masterpiece crumbling under the weight of its own complexity, with visual effects and an overall production that's uneven at best. You will enjoy this despite the whole action being quite difficult to understand during your first watch. State-of-the-art practical effects coexist with stop-motion animation, constantly carried by dialogue that is way too serious, too self-important, but impactful. And underneath all the eccentricities lies something beautiful, expensive sets recreating Taisho-era Tokyo on massive sound stages, and creatures, minor work done by H.R. Giger, the man responsible for the xenomorph design in Ridley Scott's Alien, that will capture your imagination. Detailed miniature models and matte paintings that will teleport you to another time and place, and a stacked cast that even includes that Japanese cinema legend known as Joe Shishiro. To top it all, you'll find a great score by the iconic Maki Ishii. Any Gen Xer and child of the 90s will no doubt smirk at Kyusaku Shimada's Yasunori Kato and his obvious influence on the aesthetics of a certain Street Fighter character. But beyond the stark quality contrast and muddled execution, Tokyo The Last Megalopolis and its source material, Hiroshi Aramada's manga, is a portrayal and a reflection of Japan in the 1980s. The movie's setting exists in tandem with the Japanese reality of the time. The novel intends to capture a key transition period that saw the country moving from a feudal, isolationist nation to a more modern, westernized economy. Outside of the screen, you found the eternal giant that almost dominated the world economy and the city pop soaked days before the lost decade era. At the heart of all this success lies a moral conflict where industrialists advocate for the bold display of material wealth, which culminated in the asset bubble, a nationalistic tone that dominates decisions and official standpoints, and science and technological achievements fueling the economy and trickling down into politics and commerce. All of the above is the picture-perfect snap of the land of the rising sun during the decade of greed and a summary of all the parallel themes covered in Jisoji's movie. In conclusion, Tokyo The Last Megalopolis may come across as a mix between Earthquake, The Omen and Rosemary's Baby to a non-Japanese watching this in 2024, but no matter the amount of imperfections, it stands out as something that truly must be seen and experienced. Just be mindful, you'll need to see it at least twice to fully absorb the whole thing. 
And for those of you who are brave enough to continue this journey, you'll be happy to know that a sequel was made the following year. Tokyo The Last War debuted in Japanese screens in 1989, though it didn't replicate the success of its predecessor. So if you're keen on esoteric visuals, if you are on board with watching a fast-paced epic that doesn't drag on, and if you're up for a Japanese entry that mixes art house cinema, historical drama, and supernatural horror, and if you're interested in finding out more about the role of horoscopes in city planning and development, then you simply can't miss out on Tokyo, the last megalopolis. Once again, I'm Peter from Vinyl and Celluloid. Thanks for watching. And if you enjoyed what I had to say about these two movies, go over to my letterbox page where you can read my reviews on over 300 other titles, both old and new. Till the next time. Keep the reels rolling.